As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. There's no crying in baseball! I ate his liver with some fava beans. I skinned. If I can change, and you can change, everybody can change! And welcome to another episode of Your Next Favorite Movie. I am your host, Josh G. And today we are kicking off what's sure to be a fun month, what I'm dubbing as the best month ever. So first up, the host of the best film ever podcast, please welcome Ian to the show. Hey, thanks a lot, Josh. Uh, best month ever. That's some, I like the way that sounds. That's some, that's some good branding you got going on there. Hey, we get it from you, man. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I will gladly accept the compliment. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we've, I don't know, we just, had, we just had a lot of fun. We've been very lucky to find a community of like-minded podcasters like yourself, and it's just a lot of fun to do what we're currently doing. Yeah, so other than that, why don't you tell everyone exactly how Best Film Ever works? All right, so Best Film Ever is basically, I, uh, in short, I teach film studies for, for, for a living. I get paid to actually watch and then analyze films with, with you know, um, upper high school year students, kind of um, 15 to 18 year olds, basically, and uh, looking really quite, quite in, in depth and intently at, um, at, at films. And so uh, on the side, I have this um, acting bug, I suppose. And a lot of my friends uh, are involved in amateur dramatics. We put on plays and musicals and things like that. And generally after we do a rehearsal, there is what they call a social club. It might be considered a pub or a bar. You, you or whatever it is, right across the street. And we would go there after rehearsal and almost inevitably the conversation would turn to movies more often than not. And we'd have these conversations. And uh, one of my best friends, Liam, I bought him a poster one year for Christmas. It was a hundred scratch off sort of uh, uh, films you must see bef bef before you die. One of those sorts of things. And he said, hey, can we watch all of them together? And I was like, yeah, let's go ahead. He said, even if we've seen them before, I said, that's not bad. And about five movies in, I kind of looked at him and went, we really should be documenting this. This feels like a missed opportunity. And I mean, yeah, and I kind of sheepishly went, do you want to start a podcast? Expected him to go, no, loser. <laughs> who, who, who does podcasts? And, and he went, yeah, I think I'd be up for that. And I just sort of let it sit. And I was like, all right. Like a few weeks later, I went, we really should be documenting this. You still up, you still up for that podcast idea? And he went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And at this point, I'm like, oh, okay, I better go make this happen. So I researched what you'd need and bought the most rudimentary of little mixers and microphones and whatnot. And uh, sort of got started there. I made the mistake of buying a two-channel mixer, which as soon as you want to have any guests, that was ruined. So I went through a few mistakes and had to upgrade very quickly. But the way it works is that I go ahead. The theory is, can we come to record on what is the best film ever? And so I look at it from my kind of academic, you know, I sort of know what to look for more than the casual movie fan might. Or, or maybe thematically, I've got a little bit more of a peak of theory and things like that. And my friends generally are looking at it from a layman's perspective about just, you know, do I like the movie? Uh, you know, how does it make me feel? What are my, my memories of this? Or if it's a first watch, what did I, but as we go along, of course, they're kind of being brought up ever so slightly each time as the conversations we have are making them pick up sort of stuff that they may see and may not see. Yeah. And we kind of come to a, 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 try to come to some sort of a numerical metric about a rating out of 10. How do we find this film? We put it in the blender and hopefully we will find the best film ever, but we're like kind of quantum week each week. We'd leap into like a new movie because the search really is never over. So we know currently our number one is the uh, Academy Award winner for best picture Chicago, but there are some heavyweights still in the chamber, shall we speak of. So there's, I have not put forward any dark Knight. I think is the only one where I put forward that I kind of went this could win. This could be the best film ever. I've got about five in the chamber, but I'm like, here are my personal five. Because we, we take turns choosing what film gets presented to the group for the week. And um, yeah, I've got about five that I'm like, these are legitimate heavyweight contenders. And it's not Grease or Grease 2. <laughs> no, no. No. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> that was someone else's chamber, I suppose. Yeah, yes, yeah. Someone else, someone's got to do it, right? Someone's yeah. got to throw it out there. You've, I can say this, you've already covered what I consider the best film ever, and that is The Silence of the Lambs. You know what? Silence of the Lambs. Um, it's really weird because 
<laughs> as we go through it was one it was one that had an anniversary so it kind of no one brought it to the table we just kind of went it's the right time to do this and i set the schedule so i guess in a sense with my executive producer hat kind of thing on i chose it but i didn't choose it for personal reasons it was just it's the 30 year anniversary. anniversary we should do silence of the lambs there's no better time plus i'm also thinking when's the optimum time for downloads i know a big anniversary it's sort of in people's consciousness let's put something out there and i was a bit disappointed in <laughs> the table's reaction to it i kept hearing the word horror i'm like i don't think it's a horror film i we had the conversation just off mic before we started about horror i'm not a big horror guy but i love silence of the lambs it's tension it's a psycho psychological thriller it's not oh it's yeah and it's one of the few films that wins the big five in it and so there's something masterful about that and, and there's that hard part where you go well, clearly everybody's gonna love this and when they don't you just kind of chew your lip and go all right you want to explain your, your thought process on that before because you don't want to go come on Although yeah, I, right <laughs> i do probably do go come on i always kind of i make sure everybody gives their their votes first and then i kind of start, try to summarize and become the voice of reason and go here's what you're not seeing but yeah right silence of the lambs great choice it's like our midpoint it's like it's like our median film which just makes me weep the idea that half the films we've done have been better than silence of the lambs i'm like i'm sure some maybe but not nowhere near that many nowhere <laughs> All right. Well, you had brought a film that I hadn't watched in quite a while. So I was kind of glad to revisit because I actually hey. forgot how good this movie is. Yeah. And tonight we're going to be talking about Little Miss Sunshine. Do you think you can win Little Miss Sunshine? Yes. We're going to California. Get on board. You're not nearly as stupid as you look. With a hilarious and heartwarming comedy. Where's Olive? Oh, no one gets left behind! That everyone's talking about. Outstanding, soldier, outstanding! I'm being pulled over. Everybody pretend She's to be normal. Little Miss Sunshine, don't get left behind. Yeah! All right! Fantastic little film. <laughs> All right, so Ian, first tell us when you first saw this. Oh, um, I would guess I probably first saw this around... I want to say 2009, 2010 would, 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 would be a guess. I was training. I was going through uni to become a teacher. And I had a mentor, actually, in, in the form of an old uh, high school English teacher that, that, that I had. And over the years, I'd actually sort of stayed in, in, in contact with very kind of loosely. But then as I went back into teaching, sort of reestablished a, a bit of a relationship there for sort of a mentor kind of perspective. And uh, he was talking to myself and said, um, he and his wife were talking to me and said, you got to try Little Miss Sunshine out. And I went, I went really? The one about, about, about the beauty pageant? Went, yeah, you have to watch it. I was like, all right. And it was just on the strength of someone else's endorsement. It wasn't anything that jumped off the uh, page. I mean, I think at the time, I was probably much more of a blockbustery kind of film goer. Blockbuster and, and, and comedy were kind of my go-tos. Like, like the, you know, the average 20-something-year-old, I imagine. But I, I sat down and watched this and was captivated by it. And I had to go instantly, I don't know, email probably, because that was the that was the time of the day, of the year, of the century it was. And went, yeah, yeah this is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for the wreck. I was not expecting to like this as much as I did. So, yeah, 2009, 2010, that beautiful yellow DVD box yep. art. Yeah, I think uh, I probably saw it similar to that time. I know my wife had gotten me into the office, so we pretty much went into it for Steve Carell, and this is obviously not The Office. So. I think I saw this because I'm really into The Office, but I think this predates my officeness. I didn't, I didn't like Steve Carell at first. I didn't get him. I didn't get him. There's something about him I didn't get. And I watched an early episode of The Office, probably when it was still season one-ish Office, when he was basically just doing Ricky. Jo the show hadn't found his legs yet and kind of went uh and then it was you know he he did what was it evan almighty and i was like uh i'm just not i'm not feeling it so actually when i first turned this on i was kind of like steve carell was the part where i was going oh i don't want to don't want to be what you know no i think i'd seen i seen 40 year old virgin i might have seen that and kind of went that's the only thing this guy's gonna do he is that guy to me forever right. <laughs> and i enjoyed 40 year old virgin I'm like he's gonna be that guy and so I was kind of sitting there. He was a deterrent rather than an attraction to watching Little Miss Sunshine. And then uh, completely had to change my tune. I've had no problem eating some crow if necessary. And that's the, and this was one of those times where I will clearly go, I was wrong. All right. So for anyone who's unfamiliar with it, why don't you tell everyone what Little Miss Sunshine is about? Little Miss Sunshine, in essence, it's 
it's a road trip movie and the the plot device that forces this dysfunctional family into a camper van is that uh, a little girl through uh, some sort of thing that happens before the film begins has now all of a sudden become eligible out of nowhere some the person who beat her at a regional uh, beauty pageant had to drop out because of scandal and so now there's a spot available for olive our our young eight-year-old protagonist to enter the regional or statewide whatever it is little miss sunshine co contest in san Bernardino, i think it is california and they live in new mexico so in order to get her there you need we need we, you know someone's got to go with her the problem is it's the family's going through some financial tough times and uh, as a result um they're gonna have to drive but because it's because of certain situations, everybody ends up having to therefore be in the van with them. It's not a matter of just one pair can go. It's, 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 it's a thing of dominoes that because one person goes, each character has to go alongside. And you have this highly dysfunctional family who clearly do not get along and you force them into this VW minibus for a couple of days. And I love film where it's just dialogue and it's just characters developing throughout. And so uh, it's just us sort of watching that journey where the, the contest becomes in many ways secondary, but it's more about the family's dynamic in this VW camper van minibus, which is falling apart as they drive it, as the family is equally falling apart. It's a perfect metaphor. Right. And um, sort of going through that. And it's 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 a comedy but it's 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 a dark comedy it's a place where you can go i can relate to this because you know we, we've all had that dysfunctional big blow up of the family at dinner or in the car or things like that and and you you enjoy watching someone else getting angry and and because you know communication is broken down to that degree and yeah i mean mom and dad are on the verge of 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 a divorce, the teenage son won't speak to anyone. Grandpa's just old and racist and homophobic. And and um, then you've got Steve Carell's Uncle Frank, who's a suicide risk and therefore can't be left by himself. And you put them all into a room with this sweet, and in the middle of all this angst, you've got this sweet, innocent eight-year-old and you put her in the middle of it. And therefore, by putting her in this hostile situation, so much comedy where you don't think there should there would be comedy, but there is, and it's, I can't believe I'm saying this, it's got such a warmth despite yep. all the cynical elements around it. It gets you right in the feels and uh, oh, it's just fantastic. All right, so we don't really go into the movie. That was good. I'm gonna <laughs> ask you something though that could be tough. I don't right. know, and I know you wouldn't want to see it. At least I don't think you would. But if you got to see a sequel, where oh. would you want it to go? And you can go back then, put, you know, Abigail <sighs> Breslin nine or 10, not even much older. I would want a situation where for some reason they do have to go back. They, they, they have to go back for another beauty pageant and they swear off it at the end. But a reason why they would have to go back for a second beauty pageant. Um, oh, it's, such, it's so difficult because with all the characters, the reasons why they're all in the van are time sensitive. Right. And so to recreate that could be very, very difficult, but it's not about the plot. It's about the fact I need them all in a vehicle. That, that's what I need in order yep. to, to create to create a sequel. So I do like the I, I wouldn't mind keeping my antagonist from the first film. She was really good in it. The, the the beauty pageant director. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a beauty. But some reason why they're all in a van and they're going back out across wherever. Um, probably has to centralize, center around Olive for whatever reason. It could be a public speaking bee. It could be any sort of situation like that. And of course, the great irony is that she's there. Maybe she's the grandmother of Olive's competitor or contestant. You could do it like that, I suppose. Um, it's so hard because people are fixed at the end of the first one and you don't want to take that away. You know, people find redemption and I don't want them to have to go. But as soon as the movie was over, they fell back into old habits. Right. I really I really want them to, to leave on on the other side of this arc they've, they've come out of. So uh, if I had to, I'd pitch it like that. I'm eternally grateful they haven't tried to go down that road and milk more money out of it. Like a good independent film should leave it as this moment in time. All right. So. We don't see too many of these with independent films, but let's say you got a remake and you had to Ooh. recast some of these roles. Yes. <laughs> hmm. 
I'm trying to think off the top of my head if I could just do like a regional reboot and say if I were to if you were to go ahead and change this and go go British or go or, or go something else. Um it's hard. I don't know many child actors, so I don't know um if there's like I, I an age appropriate young actress who I would put in Abigail Breslin's role, who is nominated for an Oscar for this. Like she nails this. So it's really hard just to say random girl um ABC. Well, what what uh, has she been in before this? Abigail Breslin? She'd been in oh, I'm sure she's been in some stuff. Uh I, I I struggle with what at this point. Definitely maybe was definitely after this. I don't yeah. know where where I don't know where they got her. I don't. And see, that um, might be the key, though, is getting an unknown. I don't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In which case, then it makes answering this sort of a question. <laughs> I mean, okay, first step, find that girl. Find, find the girl that is. But you got to fill in the family. <laughs> um. Oh, geez. It feels like a cheat. But I think you could put Brian Cranston in the Greg Kinnear role. I think that could work, although Brian Cranston appears in this film. But yeah. something like that. Tony Collette's a hard, a hard replacement there. She's really strong. I who would go? Oh, you know what? Uh, who's that girl? Uh, uh, Catherine Hahn. Catherine Hahn from uh, who's kicking it big right now because of her role in Wandavision. But um, I think when I've seen her do dramatic stuff, she's really, really quite strong. Uh, or if you want to go a little bit older, if for some reason instead of parents we go grandparents or some of that. Well, no, 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 I still want grandpa. But if I'm going to go Brian Cranston, I mean, Tony Collette, you could also get the same feel from sort of like Alice and Janney. She could do something like this because there's a real strength in, in Tony Collette's performance in this. Paul Dano, um, <laughs> in all of his teenage angsty moodiness, uh, is, is fantastic in this. Uh, again, it's about do, do I know a whole lot of young teenage sort of uh, actors or p people who can play young teenage sort of actors i don't know about that one uh grandpa alan ark oh, it's just it's so hard because it's just so perfectly done i know <laughs> it's so so perfectly done that like, the casting is phenomenal alan arkin does win an oscar so abigail breslin's nominated alan arkin wins for his role as edwin grandpa hoover i mean it's so much more than just a crotchety old man although at first blush it's what it feels like it is and so I might go with Terry O'Quinn, who people might remember as John Locke from Lost. And if you're a horror guy like me, you remember him as the stepfather. Oh, really? Okay, brilliant. From the 80s. Yep. Yeah. So I think I think he can do warm. I really do. We can he can definitely do unnerving because that introduction where he goes off about the chicken. I mean, you gotta be able to frighten someone. And Terry O'Quinn can can do can do the frightening thing. So, but I think you can also do the warmth. It's, it, it, it's definitely a hard balance. And then the one that I'm really struggling <laughs> with is the Steve Carell role because it is so multifaceted. He's my favorite character in the film by far. And I'm just trying to go who's got that kind of depth and that kind of range. And he has to be pitiable. So he's not your typical Hollywood leading man type. He's more like your who's the guy who's your secondary supporting character type in a lot of sort of these sorts of films oh it's really difficult who i'm just going through the rolodex everybody's too good looking that's my problem everybody i'm thinking of is just way too good good look good looking for this for this role where you know you don't want you can't buy brad pitt or something of that nature in there because it's just like it's not believable for the storyline we're going to go down oh i'm just trying to think of people who have on stuff that's that tightly acted <sighs> you know what you know what if you want to go down a slightly different road with this i'll take this peter dinklage oh okay peter dinklage because give him one more reason give him one more yeah, thing yeah. to sort of to sort of feel that he's neglected to feel that he's not valued for his for his worth I, I I don't want to limit his character to that. There's a whole bunch of other elements. But tell me, you know, in in the role of the character who plays the college professor, who's the number one guy in his field, but everybody seems to prefer a number two guy in the field, including this grad student he has a crush on. It adds a whole nother, nother level if you get the idea about what is normal, in a sense, and sort of have him sort of be a bit more embittered about that as well. So I'll go Peter Dinklage, which is not something I was expecting to go, but I think it could work. 
Because Peter Dinklage can do anything. The guy is just a great. And it needs to be a character who can orate. It needs to be a character who can generate sympathy, generate bitterness, but also generate wisdom at the end. And he needs to be able to do all these sorts of things. I quite like this. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I like it. I like this cast. So, yeah. I'm not saying I want a remake, but. No, that's the thing. I definitely don't. I definitely don't want a remake. But if we have to, if this is what we're stuck with, right? If if, if we're being told, no matter what happens, this is getting made. Do you want to have your opinions in here, or should we just cast Jim Carrey? I'm like, no, no. Please take what I have here. Please, please, please. Yeah, really. Jim Carrey will do all the roles. <laughs> oh no, no. Please don't do that. Please no. Please no. All right, so. The last thing I want you to sell this movie to someone who maybe they don't like little indie movies. Maybe they don't oh. like any of these people. Just sell it to people. I, if you're around me long enough, you'll frequently hear me say the hardest thing to pull off in a movie is warmth, legitimate warmth. And it's interesting that we talked about the office. Cause I think the office, the American version manages to generate warmth in a way that, that in modern society, we're awfully cynical and we're awfully, um, suspicious or whatever it is. And we've got so much of a, of, a, of a sharp, sarcastic edge to us, which which I love, but there's very few things that pass that sort of genuine spirit that we don't reject. And yet this is one of those things that clearly, clearly does. Uh, you find yourself immersed in the characters because they're relatable, because their dinner table could be your dinner table. And when you get stuck on the bus, we've all been stuck on a car trip uh, with family or with friends where you kind of wish you weren't there and you're there because you have to be and it's out of compulsion and you just want this to end and it gets worse. And in, 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 in the midst of all this negativity, there comes a shared experience that yes, this stinks, but we made it through it together. And we might kind of hate each other, but for you from the outside, no, you don't get to do that. This is my family, that's why I get to hate it, but you don't get to do that from the outside. And there's a surprising bonding experience that happens there. And we see characters who we genuinely feel legitimate, I'm gonna go as far as saying hatred for, and we see them find redemption. And there's something wonderful in seeing someone having that light bulb moment in a way that's earned and is earned because the writing on this film is fantastic. It also, if I recall correctly, wins an Oscar. I think, I think the screenplay wins, wins an Oscar. It's a beautifully told story. The scoring is absolutely fantastic. It may as well be another character in the film. I hear those opening notes and my heart swells because I know what I'm in for. And then it all builds towards a third act that you don't see coming. There is a moment that just, you think you know what you're getting with this film and it sort of pivots and it still feels earned. It, it, it pivots, but you still go, this makes sense. If I go back across the film, all this lines up. And then we leave the characters in a place where we don't have final closure, but we have the idea that they're in a good place. And that's really all that you can ask for. Their problems aren't all fixed because that wouldn't be realistic, but they're moving towards a better moment. And in that, you can find hope because just like the rest of the characters, you too have been stuck in the van experiencing all of this, aware of this. And then as we, as, as we choose to leave them or as we're told we have to leave them and we get out of the van, at least we know we're leaving them better than we found them. And I think because of the authenticity of the relationships, the dialogue and who the characters are, I think the audience feels fulfilled that it's not just some cheap paint by numbers, what's the next exciting incident, but it is a genuine moment. And St Steve Carell steals the sh in, 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 a, in a film full of powerhouse performances and Alan Arkin, God bless him, deserves his Oscar, sure. But he steals the show, this guy can act. This was my introduction to Steve Carell, not the comedian, Steve Carell, the actor. He takes all of the acting and steals it and puts it in his back pocket. So go and and the greatest, I'll say this again for anybody who who come come at me, the greatest prepubescent acting performance I've ever seen, Abigail Breslin in this film. High praise from me. There you go. High praise. When I talked about having some stuff in the chamber, this 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 might be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I think that's going to wrap it up. Why don't you tell everyone where they can find you? You can catch more of my dulcet Canadian tones surrounded by 
uh, three British people and the odd time we let our resident uh, New Zealander Kiwi come and join us. Over at Best Film Ever, we drop new full reviews on a Tuesday, some sort of bonus episode on a Friday, and currently on Sundays, we're dropping episode-by-episode episode breakdowns of Disney's original series, Loki, on Superhero Sunday. So, uh, that's uh, Twitter. You can find us at Best Film Ever Pod. Probably the best place to go to stay in touch. Uh, it's how I met Josh here. It's how I meet most people. It's how, if you want to be on that conversation, um, that's the place to do it. I really enjoy the level of discourse we, we, we have out there. Uh, we do have a Facebook page. Uh, we do have Instagram, also Best Film Ever Pod. Twitter is the best place to go ahead and grab a hold of us, though. And, um, best thing is come check us out get joined in with the conversation and i think you'll be surprised how much interaction and interactivity there is between the uh the listener base and and the product that gets onto the uh pod waves if you will absolutely i'm one of them i'm talking with them all the time so i can hey. vouch for that so but as always you can follow the show we're on i'm on instagram as well but yeah i'm more active on twitter as well yNF movie pod available wherever you get your podcast and be sure to check back next week is Liam will join the show. Hey, hey, hey. He's going to yeah, be yeah. talking about Greece. It's the you word. Guys, <laughs> you guys take care. I'll talk to you next time. <laughs>